Welcome back to Sleep for Performance podcast. This is season seven, episode 12. This is our last episode in this season and today I'll be joined by Cassie Hilditch. But before we finish off this season, we do have a sponsor. We have a sponsor from Element or LMNT, which it will appear on the product. So what is Element? Well, this is a, a partnership that we have formed with Rob Wolf. You may remember or know Rob Wolf from being on the Learning to Die podcast and our podcast I host with Kieran O'Regan. And he's been on the Joe Rogan podcast at least twice, maybe three or four times even, but twice that I know of. So this is a, a great drink. It's an electro, electrolyte drink, which uh, aims to basically eliminate any of your deficiencies or imbalances with electrolytes that can cause symptoms such as headaches, cramps, fatigue, and weakness. Uh, it's very good if you're fasting on a low carb diet, if you're an athlete as well, or you got any, any other sort of health conditions. I really like it in terms of the amount of exercise I do. And as I get older, it's uh, very, very helpful. So mainly what it is, is an electrolyte drink without all the sugar and the colorings to go with it. It's a powder form. You just mix it with some water and you skull it. It's very nice. It comes in lots of different flavors, which you can check out on the link in the show notes. If you click on, click on that link in the show notes, it will bring you to a Sleep for Performance specific page where you can get a, a free gift of your first order. And if you're not entirely satisfied, Rob will give you your money back. Um, this is an excellent product. Uh, it contains potassium, sodium, and magnesium. So not just good for daytime activity, but will also uh, enable good sleep as well. As we know, magnesium is good for sleep overnight. Now, this product is widely used with the U.S. Olympians. It's used in the NFL, the NBA, NHL. It's used with special forces, tech leaders, and everyday health as well, people like myself. So if you would like to try LMNT or Element, please go to the link in the show notes and click on it to get your free gift now. All right, welcome back to Sleep for Performance podcast. It's nice and cold here in Western Australia at the moment, hence why I'm rugged up and it's early in the morning. It's a very cold 16 degrees Celsius, which is uh, getting quite soft here, Cassie. That's the way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, today, well, today I'm joined by uh, Dr. Cassie Hilditch. Uh, so Cassie, um, where about you located today? So I'm joining you from my house in San Francisco in California, um, where it is sunny, but um, also kind of chilly. It never really gets very hot here. So um, managed to avoid the fires so far that are brewing nearby. They got fires up there, have you, in California at the moment? Okay. Yeah, it's um, start of the summer. So much like Australia, it's just always fire season here. And so, Cassie, you're obviously not from the U.S. originally. Where are you from? Uh, yes, I'm originally from Adelaide, um, and I've lived in London for a little bit. But I've uh, I've been in the states for about six years now, and four years on the west coast here in California. Is that why you got that strange accent, though? Yeah, <laughs> I think it, I think some of my words give me away either way. So. <laughs> In, a, in America, they think I have an Australian accent, and in Australia, they think I have an American accent. So, somewhere, yeah, somewhere in the Pacific. <laughs> it's very odd. I actually think that my brother lives in Vancouver, and um, he's got a crazy kind of Canadian American type accent going on. But then, when he hangs around me for a few days, he starts getting a real strong Irish accent. I do think that for some reason, the American accent comes true really quickly with people. I've seen a number of Australians, English and Irish go to the States or Canada and really quickly mm -hmm. they, they come with a, they come back with an American accent. Unfortunately, I haven't done the same in Australia. Uh, yeah, despite, I was going to say you haven't despite, lost despite, much. Despite my efforts, my, it ain't coming true. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, a strong C, yeah. yeah. <laughs> C plus maybe. <laughs> we don't use the C word here. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, so you're from you're from Adelaide originally. So you got a few. To, actually, I was in Adelaide last week. Yeah, I was there for a oh, few nice. days. I, I was talking to some of your old, uh, probably uh, comrades in arms, Siobhan Banks. Yes, yeah, you she know, was my uh, supervisor for my PhD. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who was my PhD examiner? <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> The the uh, sci the scientific family tree. So yeah, I was in Adelaide for a while, yeah. staying down in um, I think it was the Hilton. That is it. Victoria Avenue or something like that. 
But anyway, in Adelaide, it was quite uh, cold. It was Victoria it was, Square, something. Victoria yeah. Square, something like that. It was mm. it was quite it was quite cold. I can tell you, it was um, I think maximum of like eleven degrees, which is quite cold for Adelaide. Yeah, and if you're mm. you're in Perth, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's usually always warmer there, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, but like I said, well, I've been sold. Yeah, yeah. 16, 16 feels cool. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so, so Cassie, um, tell us about um, growing up in Adelaide. Did you always want to be a scientist, or uh, what was your what was your what was your goal or ambition? Gosh, I think um, I think my my first sort of career ambition was to be a firefighter that lived on a farm. Um, so I'm not sure. I've I've strayed pretty far from from those uh, initial goals. But um, I actually wanted to be a journalist um, sort of all through high school. And that's why I sort of chose just a whole range of subjects in high school. And I applied to get into journalism at uni mm -hmm. and I got in and my second choice was, um, was just a bachelor of science. And I'd done, taken biology in year 12 and just loved it. And I just, at when I got the offer letter for journalism, I was like, I think I'm going to do science. <laughs> and that's kind of where the, the pivot point was. And um, I'm always tempted to go into maybe sort of science communication or sort of uh, science journalism, maybe sort of steer back towards that um, journalism passion. But yeah. I don't I think you, I, I don't think you do very well in scientific communication because you have to have um, an Instagram uh, account where you're half naked. You have to be not in the field of science and you have to be quite opinionated in one direction or the other to be a scientific communicator these days for a, for a newspaper. Right. Well, I do have a, an Instagram account for an opossum because I uh, volunteer at a wildlife rescue center. So I'm a foster parent for a, a blind opossum that has uh, more followers than I ever will. So. <laughs> Like people with their uh, uh, with their an, um, animals, like dogs, have more followers than they do. Like twenty thousand followers from people to dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. So, so you end up doing uh, science. Did you do that at Uni SA as well? Uh, I actually did my undergrad at Adelaide Uni, um, Adelaide Uni and then Adelaide. I did my yeah I did my honours at the Adelaide Institute for Sleep Health um, with uh, Doug McAvoy and Pete Catcherside. Yeah. And um, I I had actually been so the if, if the next question is where, how do I get into sleep? Um, my sort of third year placement for physiology, you get sort of put in a lab somewhere and we got sent out to the far flung corners of Door Park at Aish. Um, and that's my, was my first intro into sleep research. And then I ended up doing my honors there cause I really liked the lab and the research they were doing. Um, but uh, yeah, kind of just, it was, again, sleep wasn't something that I always, wanted to do or had a particular interest in but once introduced to it i sort of fell in love with it yeah and i've said this to nearly every podcast guest um on every episode like you know nobody sits there chewing the pencil looking out the window going someday i'm gonna be a sleep scientist and get out of here you know it's just <laughs> everybody falls into it from weird and wonderful backgrounds from exercise physiology to psychology to science to you know, through a workplace through health and safety through sports mm -hmm. there's so many different you know routes of entry to the sleep science world, which which is great because it creates lots of cross pollination, different ideas and different applications, different knowledge, and then breaking out to like sort of sleep general sleep science, sleep disorders, chronobiology, chrononutrition, all these other fields we see emerging now. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Right. I think it makes sense. I mean, we all do it, right? And it should yeah. be roughly a third of our lives. So it makes sense that sort of um it as sleep touches everything, then there's, you know, everyone can be involved in studying sleep. So yeah, yeah, I really like that sort of cross-disciplinary uh, research um, area Definitely. that we can work in. And now, Cassie, I could be wrong. Did you did you take a break after your honours and take a few years working before you did a PhD, or did you go straight into a PhD? Yeah, so I um, so I took a break, break between undergrad and honours, just so you know. Yeah. The, the classic Aussie thing of backpacking Europe <laughs> for a year and then uh, and then yeah between honours and um, my PhD I moved to London for five years and I worked as a fatigue risk management um, consultant in a small company that sort of um, helped uh, you know sort of safety critical industries with their fatigue, fatigue management programs 
Um, so it was, yeah, had a lot of fun there. Got to get involved in a lot of awesome projects around the world. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. That was with Clockwork, was that? With, um, yeah, Clockwork Research. With Alex. Mm -hmm. Alex. Yeah, Alex Holmes. Alex Holmes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and at the time, Paul Jackson <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I did think that, yeah. And then I thought, maybe I'm imagining that. Yeah. Because... As you get older yeah. and more tired, you start imagining things. <laughs> yeah. Also, one of those weird things where I didn't actually know Alex previously from Adelaide. It just turned out that she was also from Adelaide and then we met in London. So, yeah, Adelaide's quite the small world um, things. Adelaide's quite the center for sleep work, isn't it? It's crazy. Like so many people. Yeah, come it's crazy. Adelaide. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sleep, sl the, the, the city called Sleepy Hollow produces lots of people in sleep because it's quite sleepy. Yeah. <laughs> I like Adelaide. People bag it out, but it's nice and quiet. It's nice and easy. I like that. You know, it's kind of similar yeah. to Perth. It's quite slow. I like that. Yeah. yeah, it's just just super easy to live there. It's really, yeah, really easy. Although you, you won't fit in when you go back with that American accent. It's not going to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can lose it pretty quickly if I need to, I think. <laughs> um, so when you went back, uh, why did you go back to do a PhD? Why did you decide that that was what you wanted to go back and do? So, I've, uh, yeah, so I've been in London for five years and um, with the same company and there was kind of uh, felt like there was sort of limited growth at that point. Um, yeah. And sort of they were saying, you know, oh, if you want to sort of move beyond this, then you need a PhD. And I was actually looking into doing one in London um, with Imperial College, uh -huh. um, which was going to be more about sort of sleep and cardiovascular health and more of the sleep apnea stuff and I but I knew from sort of being at age that I didn't really want to go down the sleep apnea route I really liked the more sort of um applied research as it pertains to shift work rather than clinical applied work um so yeah so it was kind of um and then I, that's when I got in touch with Siobhan actually and we had sort of the correspondence from from London and got uh, my letter of acceptance when I was still there sort of uh, and had to make the move. But um, yeah, I can't remember what the kind of final decision making process was. Maybe yeah. that it was just sort of time to move home for a bit and that kind of thing. Yeah, time to come home so you could go again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> didn't last long. <laughs> no. And so um, what was the focus of your PhD studies? What, what was your main topic? What were you looking at? Um, so mainly it was about short naps and then sleep inertia. So alertness and performance following those short naps um, and looking at naps um, that would sort of take place in a sort of uh, simulated night shift environment. Yeah. Um, and I also did a whole study on um, split sleep as well. Um, that was looking at sort of rotating six hours on, six hours off, or eight hours on, eight hours off. Um, and again, my sort of piece of the data was the the performance and alertness in the hour after waking, so the sleep inertia sort of segment. Um, yeah. Excellent. We'll circle back to some of those topics in a moment. Um, so you finish your PhD, and then did you go? You did you go straight to the states again? Another thing that could be a memory, or it could be could be real. Could be <laughs> did you go with Ken Wright for a while in Denver, or Colorado? Boy? Um, so I didn't actually um, have a position with Ken, but I think when I first moved here, mm -hmm. I did just spend a week or so there because it was just uh -huh. before a sleep meeting in Denver. So okay. Ken had invited me to sort of um, visit the lab and things like that. But um, uh, no, unfortunately, didn't have the the pleasure or privilege of, of working directly with Ken. But um, the first sort of postdoc that I did was actually with uh, Mary Cascadden in um, at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. So I had two different grants that um, sort of funded that postdoc. So I actually got the, um, the Helen Bear Park from ASA, um, and then had the Z Australian government grant called the Endeavour Fellowship. I'm not sure if they still run it, but um, so that's that gave me another sort of six months um, at Mary's lab. Okay, that was my okay. my first my first home in America, a little little Providence, Rhode Island, and I fell in love with it definitely. 
it's very different in San Francisco. I think the New England area, it's very different. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and it's but I but I loved having four seasons. I loved having snow, and then actually yeah. experiencing a spring. I just yeah, yeah. even in even in London, it's sort of you know you have a little bit of seasons, but it's pretty just you know it just drizzles all year, and then May yeah. is nice, and then <laughs> but in in yeah in the East Coast you get hardcore winter you get a beautiful spring hot summer and then obviously the autumn is also spectacular so it was oh yeah definitely fun and now in san francisco it is 20 degrees every day year round and that's it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you're right about up that area in new england it's quite nice i remember one time i drove from with a friend from montreal down to boston down through vermont fantastic absolutely beautiful you know, the colours, the, yeah, and I've been there at different yeah. times of the year between Montreal and Boston and, yeah, to see, like, you know, middle of the winter, middle of the summer. Yeah, yeah. Really, really, really different, you know, in terms of the contrast, you know, you go in the middle of winter to somewhere like Montreal or Boston and, you know, it's like minus 20, <laughs> 25 in the wind chill. And then you, then, you, yeah. then, you go, then you go, oh, I won't get caught out again. I'll bring more clothes. And you go back in July and you're like, <laughs> it's like 35 degrees and the humidity is crazy and you're just like dying, walking yeah. around. Completely bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea that it would be so humid. Yeah, really. Like I, humid. I just yeah. didn't picture places that would get snow would also feel. I always think like, oh, humidity. You know, yeah. it's tropical. It's equatorial, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the same. I remember, like, you know, I I experienced sort of humidity in Queensland of Australia or Thailand or Singapore. Mm -hmm. But I never. I said to my wife, "There's nothing like the humidity in Montreal, like for example, which is not too far <laughs> away from that area." In, in in summer, I said I nearly died, like in the middle of July, August. That was just oppressive. Yeah, and the same in yeah. New York as well. New York, New York humidity is oppressive as well. So you don't get that in yeah, San Francisco. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, I think it's part of that that sort of the infrastructure there that's built mainly to keep warm in the cold. And so when it is hot and humid, there's not like, no one has AC, no one's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> prepared for it. Um, but yeah, no, San Francisco is in this sort of little, um, well, it has lots of microclimates within it even, um, but it is a pretty steady sort of a little too cool for my liking, but um, otherwise pretty nice temperature year round. And then you go drive an hour inland and it's 20 degrees hotter. So if you, if I need to warm up, I just drive east. Going. <laughs> now, when you said San Francisco is a little bit too cool for your liking, we're talking about temperature. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's about the right level of cool uh, for otherwise. <laughs> so, so Cassie, where are you now? What's the focus of your position at the moment? So I'm currently um, working for San Jose State University. Um, which uh, obviously working from home for the past two years, but otherwise I'm um, based as a contractor from them down in uh, Mountain View, which is in, you probably heard of Silicon Valley, California. So yeah. I work right over the fence from Google. Um, and uh, yeah, my, I mean, my research focus is still largely around sleep inertia um, in terms of the projects that I lead. Um, but I'm also sort of heavily involved in just aviation research generally. So looking at fatigue in either short haul or long haul operations. Um, and yeah, I think that's a sort of the, the core of it, but I also, you know, in research, you're always sort of involved in multiple projects, yeah, yeah. uh, that are <laughs> sort of spin-offs from there. And you doing any teaching there as well, or just research? I don't do it, any teaching actually. Um, yeah, it's sort of, I'm, I'm, yeah, somewhere between, I'm not sort of core faculty, um, staff. So it's this sort of weird hmm. non-academic position at an academic institution sort of contracted out to a government agency. So I'm sort of, <laughs> You're sort of all um, the place, floating yeah. in between there. Yeah. Um, what's your long-term goal, Cassie? We you think you'll stay in the US or will you come back to Australia or will you go somewhere else? What do you think? 
it's a million dollar question. Um, I think, um, so my husband's actually studying a master's at San Jose State as well. And so he has and a year left his on supervisor. that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> conflict of interest. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think we, when he finishes his study and when my visa is next up to sort of um, renew again, we were thinking that we might try to move back to Australia and um, and live there. It's just sort of hard to, as I say, because I'm not sort of in this pure academic track, trying mm. to think of, you know, what to transition to moving yeah. home. Um, and, but as you say, there's there's such a sort of sleep is um, sort of at the, the crossroads of so many different um, industries that, uh, yeah, I just have to think about where I want to go and where I can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah, it's probably a good time, seeing as Australia is crying out for lots of people for work. So, yeah. Oh, really? There you yeah. Go. Oh, it's uh, bonkers, particularly here in Western Australia. Can't get anybody. So, I think even if you wanted to pivot into different roles, like you know, I don't know, health and safety, government stuff, even if it wasn't research, it was more kind of applied stuff. There's lots and lots of opportunities. So, people are going crazy here trying to get staff. There's lots of uh, lots of vacancies in particularly in Western Australia on mining oil and gas. It's been booming. So gotcha. yeah, I talked an article last week said, um, where are we now? July 26 or something. An article last week said in Australia, that maybe we're at full employment. We, you know, even though the employment rate is so low, maybe those people can't be employed for various reasons. And then we're at full, full employment. So, um, the new labor government, which I think is sitting today for the first time is, uh, I think processing nearly a million visas at the moment to get into the country. So there's that much of a short. Oh, wow. So maybe yeah. I should, uh, yeah, get my husband's visa started. <laughs> yeah. Is he Australian or American? He He's American. Oh, yeah. I don't think, I don't think we can have any more foreigners in here. I think I was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, his Australian accent's not too bad though. He can. Tell him, he tell him could, the practice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> get him a, get him a VB uh, singlet and a pair of stubby shorts and yeah, get him to walk in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going yeah, to say, have to let me in to let anybody in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Enough of my stupid jokes. Let's get into uh, some of this stuff, Cassie, that you have been researching. So one of your your topic of main interest, which a lot of your papers are around, <clears throat> is what's called sleep inertia. How would you describe sleep inertia for somebody who has no idea what sleep inertia is? Basically, if you wake up and you just want to go straight back to sleep, that's sleep inertia. Uh, you wake up and you feel more tired than when you went to bed in the first place. That's sleep inertia. Um, when you feel sort of disoriented, groggy, um, cranky, that's uh, sleep inertia. So it's sort of how you feel and how you perform when you first wake up. So when you say first wake up, what are we talking about the first five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, hour, two hours, three hours? What might it be? So typically the sort of, um, it, it sort of is at its most severe as soon as you wake up and then it sort of dissipates across time. So, and how long it takes to dissipate sort of can depend on, a, on a various factors, but I would usually say that in roughly 15 to 30 minutes, you should have sort of dissipated most of your sleep inertia related impairments, hmm. um, but that it can take up to an hour ish for you to be sort of fully alert and at your sort of maximum wakefulness capacity. And then, the, yeah, sort of, but within those first 15 to 20 minutes, that's where the sort of uh, most severe um, symptoms can occur. And how would you know the difference between sleep inertia and with what I would call just basic exhaustion? Yeah, so it's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, certainly if, you're, if you've had a lot of prior sleep loss and, um, you know, you haven't had enough sleep to recover from that when you first wake up, um, it's the sort of common, it's, it's always sort of a combination, right? Yeah, so yeah. when you first wake up, it's sleep inertia on top of not having had enough sleep. And then once the sleep inertia wears off, you're still below your best because you still haven't had all the sleep that you need. 
Mm. Um, so yeah, definitely is, you know, the third process determining how sleepy you feel in combination with circadian and homeostatic drive for sleep. And so the the thing that's been raised over the last probably couple of years, and no surprise, you know, during sort of crazy world that we've been living in, is people have been complaining about exhaustion, you know, staying at home, trying to work, trying to homeschool, trying to do this, trying to do four or five different things. And so how do you parse out, I suppose, sleep inertia from exhaustion? Would it be would it be fair to say, like you said, you might have sleep inertia for up to an hour a day, but then if you're still feeling like crap for the rest of the day, this might be long-term exhaustion from, you know, sort of mental fatigue, physical fatigue, and so on. Would that be, would that be fair enough to say that? Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. Um, it might be that your sleep inertia symptoms might also sort of extend a little longer, um, but also, um, you know, there's, and, I, and I'm more focused sort of on, again, that sort of um, applied performance aspect, but there is literature that looks at sleep inertia from a clinical perspective, and there's a lot of associations between, say, depression and sleep inertia. So people that feel like they just never fully wake up mm. when they wake up in the morning. Um, so that can, and so, you know, that might um, manifest as feeling exhausted all day, but it's that they never feel like they ever truly wake up. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of, there's a sort of crossover with depression symptoms and that sort of experience. Um, and so, yeah, so it's sort of hard to sort of pull apart the yeah. individual components, but yeah. Yeah, like everything, I think it's science. It depends. It could be multi multifactorial each one. So mm -hmm. how do you measure sleep inertia in humans, Cassie? So typically, um, it's important to look at both sort of the subjective and objective uh, outcomes. So how people feel um, and also how well they perform on sort of uh, cognitive tasks or Usually we use, you know, the, the classic PVT, the reaction time task, um, but also some sort of um, kind of more complex tasks such as uh, sort of mental arithmetic um, or matching symbols and codes, that kind of thing. Um, and you want to sort of, because it can dissipate really quickly um, and it can last for a long time, um, you really want to have sort of as many test points as you can across mm. sort of from immediately waking up so that you can really capture what happens as soon as you wake. Um, and then typically every 10 to 15 minutes across at least an hour so that you can really get a good sort of picture of, um, you know, when you're returning to your pre-sleep or whatever sort of baseline you've determined. Uh, yeah. So how would you know then the difference between someone's just base level um, and the effects of sleep inertia? If they, if, they, if they had a high level of, we'll say, I don't know, inherent or previous sleep inertia when you're doing these tests, how would you control for that? Yeah, so God, you said that it wouldn't be like ASA questions. This is <laughs> not ASA questions. I'm, I'm actually just interested. <laughs> Hold on a minute, I'm going so, to pause this recording. Listen, Cassie, yeah. just questions, relax. You don't have to answer them. You're not under any pressure. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a good question, though. So um, depending on what baseline you're using as to how you're sort of defining sleep inertia. So you typically we'll take a pre-sleep measure as baseline. But okay. that pre-sleep measure could be having been awake for 24 hours. So it's not oh, your yeah. best, certainly. Yeah. But then... If you see that you're worse when you wake up, you can see that that's the sleep inertia, right? Because you should be, yeah. if you're really sleep deprived and you have sleep, you should be better. Um, and so, um, yeah, so it's, and, and then sort of operationally, it's sort of like, oh, well, should we nap in this circumstance? Or how long should we nap for in order to get the benefits of the nap, but avoid as much sleep inertia as we can? Um, that kind of thing. So, um, but yeah, you're right. The, your, your, your baseline might not be your best either. Um, so it's important to sort of recognize yeah. that. 
and the reason I asked that is because, and this is a legitimate comment you will get in, in consulting and operations, and you may have had it as well from your experience. Some people might turn around and go, well, you know, Johnny over there or Jan, they're just an idiot and they never react well at any time because they're really dumb. Yeah. Like people will actually say that to you. Oh, you can't mm-hmm. like assess that person for alertness because he's just an idiot or she's just an idiot. They're always like that, regardless of what sleep to get. So that's why I'm trying to wonder about how would you know about the difference? Because sometimes with some yeah. people, as you know, is they're just really sleep deprived the whole time. And then when they get lots of good sleep or you control those things, they actually like a new person. And I've seen that with people that got treated right. for like OSA or had a new schedule or mm-hmm. came off nights on today's. It's like they went up by 50 IQ points. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, yeah. just a completely different person because of it. That's, that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, um, I, I agree that, you know, some of it's a misperception that someone is just like that, but it turns out that they're just like that because they've had chronic mm. sleep loss for 40 years from yeah. being a shift worker. Yeah, yeah. Um, or they've had OSA and not, known it and when they get CPAP it's they're a whole new person um but there's also you know um individual differences so uh that's why we always want to have a uh baseline that's within subject so you're always comparing a participant to their own performance yeah. um at whatever pre-selected baseline mm-hmm. you have um and then, yeah, and, and ideally, you know, if you can have within subjects across different conditions that you put them under, just with any science, you know, it's always going to be a stronger comparison to be within subject and sort of account for those individual differences. And there is actually some uh, research coming out now on individual differences in sleep inertia, um, just as there is sort of individual differences in the vulnerability to sleep loss so some people you know can stay awake mm. 24 hours yeah. and maintain their performance and other people just crash and burn and that i'm probably <laughs> more of the latter but um yeah some uh i think it's lundholm at al um out of hans van dongen's lab they just showed that um there's yeah individual variability in sleep inertia and that it's independent of whether you're vulnerable to sleep loss per se which is pretty interesting but they only looked at um the karolinska sleepiness scale so just Mm. one time point of a subjective scale so just sort of how people feel um so it'd be really interesting to sort of extend that into how people actually perform because and now i'm going on another tangent but the um because how people perform and how people think they perform during sleep inertia doesn't match very well um oh yeah so So yeah, in the, one of the napping studies that I did for my PhD, um, we asked people after a 10 or 30 minute nap in the middle of the night, sort of a simulated night shift, um, how well do you think you performed after the nap? And everyone, th- after the nap, they're like, oh yeah, I performed better after the nap. But um, on, after the 30 minute nap, their performance was actually far worse. So they weren't aware of that impairment in that time period. Um, so again, it's why it's really important that we're sort of, whenever we're measuring sleep inertia, we're looking at how do you feel, how do you actually perform? Um, Mm. and then we can use that, that evidence together to be able to sort of educate people about, um, you know, even if you think you feel fine when you first wake up, you might still be impaired. So it's still best to have, you know, some sort of countermeasure or wait a minute before you, you know jump in that huge truck on the edge of the mm. cliff like <laughs> so ju- just just to clarify there the people in that study with the nap it was when they woke up so in that period of potential sleep inertia that's when their mm-hmm. testing score was actually low but they felt like they were better yes yeah. okay yeah. so it's in that period there for that sleep inertia interesting and so mm-hmm. with with sleep inertia then is there a time of day effect so if i wake up at three o'clock in the morning versus 3 p.m in the day versus 9 a.m versus 11 p.m um, mm-hmm. independent of the amount of sleep let's say for i got eight hours sleep but before all those conditions is the sleep inertia different between those time of between the different the different time of day <laughs> yeah yeah so it's um typically worse if you're waking up during the period of time that you would normally be asleep so if you usually sleep from 11 p.m to 7 a.m and you have and you're waking up at some point during that time and 
then you're likely to have worse sleep inertia than if you took a nap during the day, say, and woke up. Um, and to your point of sort of, you know, um, keeping the amount of sleep you have constant um, and being able to measure sleep inertia independent of the change in your performance just from the circadian rhythm itself. Um, Frank Shearer and his group um, did what's called a forced desynchrony study where you're able to sort of tease apart all of those things. And that was sort of the, the seminal study that showed that sleep inertia did have this time of day effect where if you woke up during your habitual night, you're going to have worse sleep inertia than if you wake up during the day. So in practical terms then, Cassie, um, let's say you're a shift worker and you do two days, two nights and four off. Classic kind of roster that's used in Australia for emergency shift, emergency uh, workers or shift workers, nurses, even in mining, processing, industrial facilities and so on. If my chronotype is an intermediate and I generally go to bed at 11 p.m., like you said, and get up at seven, but my day shift starts at six. And let's say I'm the type of person that wants to get up early and do my exercise before I go to work. So that means I have to get up at 4 a.m. I want to go to the gym for an hour, have a shower, quick breakfast and get to work at six. I'm getting up at 4 a.m. But you're the type of person that goes, no, I'm not getting up that early. It's too early. I'm going to get up at 5.15, quick shower, breakfast and go to work. Would it be fair to say that my sleep uh, inertia at 4 a.m. will be considerably different than your sleep inertia at 5.15 a.m.? because I'm more back into that window of circadian law when I should be asleep. Therefore, I'm more at risk driving to the gym, cycling a bike on the road, whatever it might be. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that waking up closer to your window of circadian law or circadian nadir is uh, going to be associated with higher sleep inertia. Also, if you're still going to bed at 11, um, and if you're waking up at four, you're getting an hour less sleep. And we yeah. know that if you have le if you have any sleep loss, then that can increase sleep inertia as well. Um, and um, and again, yeah, if you if you're looking at sort of jumping straight in the car and driving, then that's where it's a problem. But if you're able to have a shower and have breakfast and spend 20 to 30 minutes getting ready before you get in the car, then that's probably a better way to stagger your activities. But I don't know if anyone showers and eats before working out, but, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but um, actually there's, and uh, uh, Katya Kovac and colleagues at CQU in Adelaide were looking at whether exercise was actually a countermeasure to sleep inertia. So could you, um, you know, wake up and, do a bunch of exercise and sort of help get over your sleep inertia. Um, but in, in their study, at least, they found that it does make you feel more alert, but it didn't improve on uh, those sort of cognitive performance tests. But as you know, from sort of exercise studies, there's so many different ways you mm. can exercise in some intensity and type and duration. Yeah. Um, so I think there's still a lot of um, opportunity to research in that area because there's sort of physiological reasons for why sleep and um, exercise should improve sleep inertia are pretty compelling. So, um, so yeah, so potentially if you have an at home gym, maybe that's the best <laughs> solution. So you're not, but you know, you don't want to, you know, injure yourself on the equipment either. Cause I think there's also, gosh, it's been a while since I read it, but um, uh, research on sort of, I think it was grip strength after yeah. waking. I think it was in an elderly population for that one um, for sort of because elderly people are at risk of falls when they get yeah. up at the night in the night to use the bathroom and things like that. Um, so sort of that motor control immediately after waking takes a little bit to to get back. And, and I don't know if you next time you wake up, try to like clench your fist and make like make a fist and it's really hard like when you first wake up it's you just feel really weak mm. um but yeah i can barely grab the toothbrush um yeah <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really interesting so here's another one in the sleep inertia because this makes me think about different um different things so a couple of things that come into my mind personally is like you know military 
you get woken up at like two, three a.m. in the morning in a in a military environment. So you know, an operational military person got no. They can't be like, oh, hold on, enemy, stop firing. I need to have coffee, breakfast, and do a few burpees. <laughs> yeah. The other thing as well is um, some events might start very early in the morning. So some ultra marathons or Ironman start at four, five, six a.m. in the morning. So you got these type of events. We spoke a little bit about shift work as well. So all of these things could potentially all lead to sleep inertia, getting up at these periods, these windows of circadian law. But does each one of those different events, we'll say commuting to work, starting a shift, doing a run, or in a military environment where you're going to have different responses, is there different adaptations to that sleep inertia or ability to overcome them based upon that response? Because I would think if someone's shooting at you, they'd wake up very quick. But if you're driving you know, a half an hour listening to an audio book, it's going to be quite different. Yes. So a lot, I think, to unpack there, and I'm trying to remember. Um, so certainly all those instances, um, you're right. It's, you know, because most people are like, oh, well, you know, when I first wake up in the morning, that's when I'm, you know, scrolling through Facebook or insert yeah. appropriate social media platform here. I'm showing my age saying Facebook. Um, but, you know, you might accidentally <laughs> don't, like don't, something. Don't worry, yeah. don't worry Cassie. I, rem- I remember encyclopedias. <laughs> so don't, you're, you're okay. Yeah. So don't, don't, you're all right. You're young. The really young thin here. paper. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had the whole set. Yep. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so there's, you, you know, you might accidentally like something that you didn't want to or whatever but there's not sort of this safety critical situation mm-hmm. going on as you're you know coming um to full alertness um but yeah in those military operations um if you're jumping in a car emergency services so sort of mm-hmm. um you know on call emergency helicopters they work generally sort of 24 or 48 hour shift they're just on yeah. call the whole time they have five minutes from the call to be blades on with the helicopter. And so it's, and again, you can't be like, oh, well, I need to wait 20 minutes before I rescue that person because that's a matter of life and death. Um, and also in um, hospital situations. So again, particularly residents in America working 24 oh, hour plus yeah. shifts and uh, napping because they need to because they've been awake for so long. But um, if they, if their pager then goes on, it goes off, you know, at the uh, in the middle of that nap, um, and then they have to make these, you know, really critical decisions. Um, yeah, that's where the sort of brief but severe period of uh, sleep inertia can become a problem. Um, in terms of how um, you can overcome each of them, or how sort of important it is in each one, you mentioned sort of the. Um, military situation where you might expect that sort of adrenaline would kick in and sort of overcome any sort of sleep inertia impairment. Um, and I think that there's there's some um, benefit definitely of the adrenaline in terms of, you know, what we know adrenaline is for, for the fight or flight response. But in terms of your kind of critical thinking that kind of prefrontal cortex, you know, higher order thinking situation, adrenaline doesn't necessarily um, help that part come online again. So I always give the example of um, there was a um, a flight in North America where the uh, first officer um, woke up from a nap in the cockpit, and it was a night flight, and um, they saw they heard ATC or air traffic control talking about lights in the near vicinity and they looked out the window and there was this bright light straight ahead of them and so without consulting the captain or anything just you know put the uh, disengaged autopilot put the plane into a nosedive to on to sort of avoid this Mm. crash with this oncoming plane with the light in the sky um but it turned out that the light in the sky was venus so there's probably no doubt that there was adrenaline coursing through the veins of that first officer as they thought they were going to have a head-on collision and made all these really quick judgments, but they weren't necessarily like good. It doesn't adrenaline doesn't necessarily lead to good judgment or good decision yeah, making yeah. Yeah, in sure, the yeah. moment. Um, so while it can help sort of recover probably your reaction time, right and um, probably that 
you know, grip strength and those kind of things. Um, if you're having to make sort of complicated decisions, um, then uh, then that sleep inertia might still be affecting um, that part of it. Hmm. <laughs> Planet dead ahead. <laughs> Five years to impact, quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, that would, the, the planet must have been very bright for him to do that straight away. But yeah, that's. that's yeah, great. I, mean, I think that's, Venus that's, is the brightest thing in the sky. So it's, yeah. Oh, Cassie, I thought you were going to say I was the brightest star. But anyway, um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is crazy. I, I didn't even, I never heard that story. That's a great story. So what do you yeah, think? And the, the, well, the message also is that while the captain was able to recover the flight, the only people that got injured were those not wearing their seatbelts. So you should always wear your seatbelt, even if the seatbelt sign's turned off. There you go. Safety never takes a break, even <laughs> when you're on a holiday. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why, yeah, be careful in that toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ooh, I think I might have caught the phantom, the phantom outside my house on the oh. verge. There's a phantom dog. Well, not a phantom dog, a phantom dog oh. owner that lets its dog shit on my verge most days. <laughs> and, um, I'm going to get a camera installed to catch this person because every time I go away for work for a few days and come back, my verge is covered in shit. So anyway, so that's, that's a sight. That, yeah, well, we're going to catch yeah. that person. My next door neighbor is a, is a judge, so we're going to catch the person. Anyway, um, <laughs> like the slight diversion from being a scientist. I'm on the hunt. <laughs> I'm on the hunt. I'm on. I'm on the hunt for a for a, a phantom dog shitter. Um, so, Cassie, speaking about Facebook and and social media and so on, what do you think about all these celebrities? You know, insert name again, or former, you know, military people are like about getting up at four a.m. and seizing the day and getting your work done and going to the gym and doing this and doing that. You know, my answer to those people is oh, that follow those people. That, you know, because some people are like, oh, I've been doing this thing where I'm getting up at four o'clock and I'm just so tired. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Believe, believe less of yeah. what believe less of what you see and more of what you hear, you know. But um, what do you think about people trying to do this? It seems to become more and more popular, I think, recently. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the algorithms of uh, Facebook are clearly uh, showing this in your feed, but not mine. So I'm not even on Facebook, but it's it's um, oh, okay. it's actually on like podcasts. It's on. Gotcha. It's in it's in news stories. It's in this kind of it seems to be really targeted, I think, at males 30 to 50 about, you know, mm. kind of extreme ownership by Jocko and the Jordan oh. Peterson effect, this kind of, you know, reinvigorating men to be men and but it's just the message is all about getting up at like mark Wahlberg does as well the rock these kind of celebrities about okay. getting up at three and four a.m in the morning to to work out and do this and do that you know and you can get two or three hours extra a day like what, yeah you, i mean what do you think I, of all this? I mean yeah it's, it sounds like sort of one of those trends or fads that are sort of you know this is the, the latest exercise regime or whatever. But I mean, as, as you well know, in terms of chronotypes that not everyone can get up at 4 a.m. Some people love it and it would suit them really well. And if that's, you know, if they um, at their feeling best rhythm from the morning this evening's questionnaire at those early times of day, um, then, and that's a lifestyle that works for them. But yeah, I would caution people sort of, that are usually waking up at 9 a.m. suddenly having this like, oh, well, if I woke up at four, like my life would yeah. be so much better because it would probably be a lot worse. Um, and it's also, I think, just generally, you know, exercise and nutrition get a lot of um, media time, get a lot of um, public sort of and, and like government messaging, health messaging, whereas sleep is, you know, we consider it the third pillar of health together with exercise and nutrition. But I think it's, and, and it's getting more recognition, but sort of um, lagging behind those other two in sort of that kind of really strong messaging that, you know, if you, and we're learning more about the fact that like, if you don't get enough sleep, mm. then it's actually harder to lose weight. You can do, you can eat exactly the same thing but if you get less sleep, you'll lose less weight. And if you, or if you exercise exactly the same way, but get less sleep, you'll lose less weight. So, um, and I, 
I'm speaking outside my sort of area of expertise, but I'm, but in terms of, you know, there's uh, about sleep being important for, you know, muscle repair and tissue repair and human yeah. growth hormone release. And, and so if you're trying to, you might not be trying to lose weight, might be trying to build muscle if it's this really macho approach that you're talking about. But again, without the right sleep, you're not going to necessarily be able to build muscle as effectively as if you balanced everything and had enough sleep, had time for the gym, um, and we're eating well, but there's only 24 hours in a day. And it's, and I feel like every social media thing is just like, just do this for five minutes a day, yeah, yeah. but there's a thousand up. of them. And how do I do five minutes? Of, if I do five minutes of each thing, I can't do all of that. Something's got to give. And usually it's sleep, right? Yeah. And look, I totally agree with you. And I think, um, I think you're right. There's different reasons why people are exercising and all. And we, there is studies, like you said, about particularly for men as they get older with lower testosterone that we're seeing a lot of. But basically, if men can focus more on sleep and by extending that sleep and getting more deep sleep, you know, the only way you can do that is by giving yourself a better sleep opportunity, be more consistent. We see that there's increase in testosterone. But I think you're, I think you're, uh, you're dead right there in terms of, you know, the the social media fads and and and, and um, the amount of time in a day because I often say to people you know people go oh, I've got a lot of trouble sleeping or, I've re I'm really focused on sleep you know but I'm you know I'm really have a lot of trouble sleeping and, and so on and I just go okay so describe your day I'll say like from the time you get up in the morning just describe your general day and then what about weekends and whatever and invariably 80% of the time what happens is actually and I'd say to them I know your problem I can diagnose your problem for you straight away and they're like, oh, what's wrong with me? Yep. Nothing. You basically have a mathematic problem. And they're like, what? You can't add and subtract. And they're like, what? There's 24 hours in a day. If you're going to bed at 10 o'clock at night and getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning, you're only allowing six hours for sleep. Therefore, you cannot get eight hours of sleep in a six-hour sleep opportunity window. I said, I don't know what happens where you went to school, but when I went to school, eight doesn't go into six. And they're like, what? I'm like, you're just not allowing enough time for sleep. You, and it's as simple as that for about yeah. 80% of the people. Yeah, but I need to get up in the morning, do my exercise and do this and do that. I'm like, well, if you're saying sleep is important, you need to be at least giving yourself at least an eight hour opportunity. So that means going right. to bed but at 10 and getting up at six. Oh, I can't do that. Like, well, then you're not going to get it. Like, it's just, it, it, <laughs> sometimes it's just that simple. It's like someone that's grossly overweight and going, oh, don't know what's wrong with me. Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with you. You're five foot ten, and you're 150 kilos, and you're eating 10,000 calories a day. So we need to reduce that, you know. And maybe it's progressively we need to reduce it. Or like your example, from nine o'clock to four a.m., we need to move back by a half an hour each day or 15 minutes. And people go, "Oh no, I couldn't do that." Well, like you're still going to get the same. You're still going to have the same out outcome. You know, nothing's going to change. So yeah. until you make that time, you're you're still going to keep having that same issue of reoccurring. Yeah, and it's. I mean, it's. But I do appreciate that it is hard to find those extra two hours, right? Um, and, you know, um, there's uh, a lot of different reasons why people don't have enough time to sleep. And depending, you know, there's a sort of strong socioeconomic uh, influences, with, you know, people having to work two jobs or, um, you know, caregivers for other people, that kind of thing. It's 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 uh it's easy for us to say oh well, you just need to allow more time for sleep but sort of having you know being able to um rearrange a lifestyle to to mm. get that sleep can be really difficult i mean if you're but if you're you know a, um you know an athlete or something like that and that is your key focus and you know two hours extra sleep can improve your performance then you're more likely to be able to sort of um kind of uh make time for that sleep because you can see yes yeah. i think it's also the thing of you know being able to being able to show people the value of what they're going to get out of it mm -hmm. um because it's it's hard to it's hard to know how much better you would feel with more sleep until you actually get it yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. So Cassie, yeah. coming back to sleep inertia, what's the what's the negative mm -hmm. impact of sleep inertia in terms of on our on our impact from a let's say a, as you say, like an operational perspective or alertness perspective, 
if we have high sleep inertia, what's the negative outcome? What's the worst things, I suppose, that can happen to us from it? Uh, on a personal level or a sort of, uh, I mean, there's, uh, there have been multiple fatalities due to sleep inertia, um, you know, sort of sleep inertia related errors in safety yeah. critical environments. Um, so that's probably the worst case scenario. Um, but in terms of, in terms of sort of, I don't, I don't know if there's been any, I don't think there's been any studies of sort of, um, you know, the health impacts of sleep inertia. Like if you mm -hmm. were someone who um, routinely sort of woke up when you wanted to still be sleeping, um, sort of what the impacts of that are. And I would, I would imagine that it's, I, again, this combination, right? Where it's if you're if you're getting really bad sleep inertia because you're waking up at the wrong time of day or because you haven't had enough sleep, then you're going to have all the negative health outcomes of you know circadian misalignment and yeah, sleep yeah. loss. Um, and sleep inertia is really just a manifestation of the interaction of those things, rather than sort of necessarily something that's adding to that physiological stress, but that being said, we again, there's very little research in that area, and there may be something about sort of um, uh, so the cortisol awakening response, for example, which is a sort of natural spike in cortisol when you first wake up, but that occurs if you're waking up sort of at a habitual time. Yeah. Um, but if you're waking up at a different time, you don't necessarily get that spike, and that's one of the theories as to why you might have worse sleep inertia because you're not having this boost in cortisol to help you um, sort of transition from sleep to wake as, as quickly as possible. So potentially missing that cortisol awakening response routinely might have some long-term effects, but uh, we I don't think we know it at this stage. And then what about personal factors? Is there anything inside our control that we can be aware of uh, or even know about, you know, is there differences between males and females, the difference between body weight, the difference between age, difference between, I don't know, height, ethnic background, the size of your nose, the size of, like, what, is there any sort of factors <laughs> that we can be aware of that may, you know, make us worse at dealing with sleep inertia than others? Yeah, I mean, the sleep inertia literature is so far behind anything sort of to do with sleep loss or circadian research so there's very little that we know about it um but in terms of those individual differences um there appears to be some sort of individual differences from that study i was mentioning earlier at least in terms of how you sort of feel when you wake up um there is there was a study of um people who habitually nap and those who never nap um and they found that um those who regularly nap or habitually nap, they had lighter sleep in their nap than those people who hated napping, didn't mm. nap, they had deeper sleep. And so they didn't measure sleep inertia in that, but I like to sort of extrapolate from that, that potentially the people who self-select as never napping probably have worse sleep inertia because they have deeper sleep when they do nap. And that's, I would put myself in that category. I, Naps are great. They're very important for various things, but I hate napping. I wake up way worse than when mm. I, you know, went to sleep uh, before I went to sleep. But some people just love a Sunday afternoon nap and might, um, on average, just have a lighter sleep and wake up feeling more refreshed without the grogginess. Um, but what drives those individual differences? We're not sure. Um, and then we are actually just starting to look at sex differences as well. Um, and it seems that there is a, um, in you know, our relatively small sample size, but it's, it's the first that I haven't seen it reported anywhere else that, um, that sleep inertia, that uh, females tend to rate their uh, sleepiness as higher when they wake up but um, higher than males, but that their um, cognitive performance is uh, not different to males. Hmm. So um, that's just sort of some a pile of data that we're looking at at the moment that 
Um, but otherwise, yeah, we don't, nothing on the size of noses yet. Um, okay. I'll stay tuned. <laughs> watch this space. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and so, so with, with um, you said there about light and deep sleep, is there any difference in the sleep inertia if you wake up in different sleep stages? So if both you and I, all things being equal, go to bed at 11 a.m., uh, sorry, 11 p.m., and then we wake up at 5 a.m., but I'm in stage one sleep and you're in REM sleep, is there a different sleep inertia based upon those stages of sleep? Yeah, so I guess I kind of got ahead of myself in talking about that. But um, so, yes, um, and the main sort of most consistent finding is that if you wake out of slow wave sleep so the deeper stages of sleep you're more likely to have worse sleep inertia than if you wake out of lighter stages of sleep like stage one stage two the relationship between stage two and REM um, is pretty inconsistent in the literature so it's not super clear whether um, waking out of one or the other in that respect is better or worse um, I, I would just hypothesize that potentially, you know, if you wake out of REM and you've been in a really vivid dream, then that might lead to sort of disorientation when you first wake up. So you might sort of be able to do a PBT as yeah, yeah. still quickly, but if you had to like, again, use those sort of higher order processes, then um, that might be more impaired from REM. But that's, yeah, there's not sort of a clear distinction at the moment. Excellent. And so Cassie, you did do a study um, on the efficacy of uh, polychromatic short wave length in rich light. <laughs> Big sentence there. Yeah. So the, what, the, what, what, what exactly the, is it? You may change it to that. <laughs> so you, um, you, 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 you shun a torch in someone's eye. <laughs> so we, we know like- light, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we know from like jet lag studies and shift work that light is our you know dominant synchronizer for you know ad adaptation to a to a new schedule or a new time zone so how does how does light help here in terms of sleep inertia yeah so light has those phase shifting effects that you mentioned so helping you adapt to a new schedule um but there's also acute alerting effects of light so there had been studies looking at the use of light um, sort of during a sleep deprivation period or during circadian misalignment, so at night, and found that um, exposure to this um, so polychromatic short wavelength in rich light just means that the light appears white, but the lower end of the spectrum, the shorter end of the spectrum, so the blue enriched kind of uh, end of the spectrum, yeah. um, <clears throat> Uh, so because different types of light have different effects. So it's really important when we're reporting them to say exactly what type of light we used. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so this kind of light can improve your alertness and performance um, immediately. So it's not something that where it's shifting a phase and you're gradually getting better over time. It's just in that moment you can improve um those outcomes. And so there had been a couple of studies that had looked at um, using light during sleep inertia and they'd found that it improved again, that sort of subjective alertness, but wasn't doing anything to help um, cognitive performance. But those studies were conducted during the day. Um, and we also have sort of this phase, sort of different responses to light depending on where we are in our circadian rhythm. So light, the acute alerting effects of light are sort of stronger if you deliver them at night. So so we sort of simulated again sort of an on-call scenario where you're sleeping yeah. during the night and you get a random call. Um, and so we wake them up and they have to do that sort of series of repeated test bouts and they did it either um, with a dim light or this specialized light. Um, and we found that, yeah, it improved um, uh, the sub subjective alertness and some mood elements as well, um, and also reduce the number of lapses in attention that people are having on the PVT. So we're pretty excited about that. And so from an operational practical perspective, is there a, is there a kind of a mobile light or something that people could use if they weren't napping in a shift work environment to, to mimic this? Yeah, so we actually, um, we took advantage of the fact that we couldn't 
access our lab for the past two years to translate the study to the field. And so we did an at-home study um, where we shipped all the um, equipment to people and then sort of uh, remoted in and walked them through how to set everything yeah. up. And we used the uh, luminette glasses. So they're glasses that are worn and have the, um, the bright blue and rich light uh, with, built into the glasses. So they are, you know, field deployable, personal wear. Um, so we're just uh, analyzing the data from that now. So we don't quite have the results as to the outcome of that translation from the lab to the field, but that's certainly, you know, something that we're always um, sort of making sure that we keep our yeah. focus on, you know, doesn't matter, it, you know, you have to demonstrate that it works in the lab, but, um, but translating in the field is super important. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Cassie, for your time today. That was a very interesting conversation on uh, the basics, I think, of sleep inertia. And I think we'll have some other chats in the future based upon some of your studies, because I think there's lots of practical application for this work into shift work environments, particularly those people working night shift who have to either nap and, and then get back to work or for those people who are doing rotating shift work. So I'm very, very interested in the uh, the practical applications of some of this work going forward. So I'd love to have you back on again to talk about some of your findings if you're uh, willing and able to come back on and hopefully you'll be back in Australia soon to help us with our skill shortage down here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. I'm always, always happy to talk about sleep inertia and uh, yeah, if um, hopefully I'll be back there soon. And so Cassie, if people want to follow you on social media or anything else or want to get in contact with you, how can people follow you, get in contact? How can they follow your work? Yeah, I don't really have um, sort of a science social media presence, but um, probably I think ResearchGate or yeah. LinkedIn um, sort of where most of the sort of updates from that side of things happen. But if you do want to follow a blind opossum, Instagram at optimistic opossums. The plural. Optimist, optimistic opossums. Okay, we might have to get you to send yeah. that through to me to make sure we don't spell it wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So LinkedIn yeah. and research gear for your scientific work, and you do post on LinkedIn there. I've seen some of your papers there, so that's great. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Thanks very much, Cassie. Um, have a nice evening in San Francisco. Hopefully, this can get below twenty, and uh, we'll talk again. All right. Thanks, Ian, and uh, stay warm. <laughs>